If you would have told people this time a year ago that Kyle Busch would be driving for RCR, they'd have asked you what you were smoking. Today I'm going to look at 10 crazy NASCAR silly season rumors that almost happened. Number 10, Jeremy Mayfield to the 48. Jimmy Johnson made the 48 his own, but Hendrick Motorsports inquired about Jeremy Mayfield's services early in the planning of the 48 team. In his Dinner with Racers podcast episode, Mayfield talked about talking to Rick Hendrick and Jeff Gordon about the new team, but he ultimately decided against it considering the fact that Hendrick's 5 and 25 teams were struggling mightily at the time, and he wasn't sure driving a fourth car for Hendrick would be any better than being the second driver for Team Penske. Ultimately, his Penske tenure came to an abrupt end in the latter half of 2001, and he took a chance on a former Hendrick stalwart and Ray Evernham's team for 2002, and we all know how that went. Number 9, Juan Pablo Montoya to the 78. It was no surprise in 2013 that Juan Pablo Montoya was going to be replaced in the Ganassi 42 by up-and-comer Kyle Larson. Montoya seemed to be on the outside looking in for a ride, but when Kurt Busch departed Furniture Row for Stuart Haas, Montoya's name became connected with the 78 car. There weren't any other viable candidates for the ride, that is until the fallout from Spingate which caused Martin Truex Jr. to lose his ride at Michael Waltrip Racing, even though he was the only driver at that team that did nothing wrong that night in Richmond. Truex fell into Furniture Row's lap and despite a horrendous first season together in 2014, the duo rebounded and became a dominant team in NASCAR, winning the title in 2017. Montoya ended up back in IndyCar with Penske, where he claimed another Indy 500 win and narrowly missed out on the championship in 2015. This one worked out for everyone, but it would have been wild to see Montoya wheeling the 78 with Cole Pern as his crew chief. No doubt, JPM would have gotten the long-awaited and much-deserved Cup Series oval, oval win at the bare minimum, and who knows how far he could have taken that car. Number 8, Jeff Gordon to Team Cool Green and British American Racing. Many people think Jeff Gordon's flirtation with F1 only occurred after he tested for Williams at Indianapolis in 2003, but as early as 1997, Gordon was being talked about for a future F1 drive. The plan was for him to partner Jacques Villeneuve at the newly formed British American Racing for 1999. Owned by British American Tobacco, the cigarette company wanted an American driver for the new team. To gear up for his F1 debut in 1999, BAT would have placed Gordon in cart for 1998, driving for Team Green, sponsored by one of the company's brands, Cool. He presumably would have partnered Paul Tracy in a Reynard Honda, which was the dominant combination of the season. However, Gordon turned it, turned it all down and stuck with NASCAR. His seat in cart eventually went to Dario Franchitti, who used 1998 as his breakout season in U.S. open wheel racing, and Gordon had one of, if not the greatest season in NASCAR history in 1998. Number 7, Nike owning a team. In 1997, Nike was interested in sponsoring or even owning a Winston Cup team and having personal endorsement deals with several top drivers. One rumor early on stated that 1997 would be Dale Earnhardt's final season at RCR before leaving to drive for his own DEI team in 1998 with Nike sponsorship. Earnhardt was famous for his marketing savvy in the late 1990s, and he tried like hell to get Nike on board with his brand. However, Nike was interested more in Jeff Gordon, as he was the younger and the top driver on the tour. The rumor even grew to suggest that Nike might start their own cup team entirely. Eventually, Nike did sign a personal deal with Gordon, who wore Nike racing shoes for several seasons. Earnhardt signed Pennzoil for DEI, but promoted Steve Park to drive DEI's first full-time cup entry, while he stayed at RCR for the remainder of his career. In a roundabout way, this rumor eventually came true as Michael Jordan's Team 2311 Racing features Nike's Jordan brand logos prominently, for obvious reasons. Number 6, Tony Stewart to Ganassi. This was the rumor that wouldn't die. Despite winning the Winston Cup Championship in 2002, Stewart's on and off track antics got on the nerves of Joe Gibbs and more crucially his sponsor Home Depot. Combine this with the fact that Gibbs had stopped Tony from doing the double in running the Indy 500 after 2001, it seemed as though Tony needed a new opportunity to pursue opportunities in both NASCAR and IndyCar. And what better team to do that with than Chip Ganassi Racing? Stewart had even driven for Ganassi in his Indy 500 start in 2001, and Chip's team was at its highest point in NASCAR at that time, with Sterling Marlin leading the points for much of 2002 before his neck injury, and Jamie McMurray winning easily in only his second cup race. It was an obvious match made in heaven at that point, but the rumor never seemed to have much truth to it. Instead, Home Depot and Gibbs decided it would be best not to give up on a talent like Stewart over his outbursts, and Stewart stuck with them for another half decade before leaving to purchase part of Haas Racing. Number 5, Chad Knauss to Red Bull. How about a crew chief rumor? You rarely ever see those mentioned in silly season. Crew chief moves are usually quietly announced like two weeks before Christmas and then everybody moves on. 
Anyway, it was rumored that in 2006, Red Bull made an enormous offer for Chad Knauss to be Brian Vickers' crew chief on the Red Bull 83 car. Knauss was by far the best crew chief in the series, so it would have helped Red Bull immensely for him to get on board and guide them and Toyota's entry to the Cup Series in 2007. Red Bull did the same thing in F1 by going out and getting Adrian Newey, the greatest F1 designer of all time, and that obviously paid enormous dividends for them, so doing something similar in NASCAR made sense. Unfortunately for Red Bull, Canal stay with Hendrick, and the team struggle for most of their time in NASCAR. This rumor is never mentioned, but it would have hampered Johnson's title runs and undoubtedly made Red Bull a better team. Number 4. Matt Kenseth to Richard Childress Racing Kenseth had a disappointing season in 2001, and he and crew chief Robbie Reiser almost left Roush at the conclusion of the season to join Richard Childress Racing's number 31 car for 2002. This one is kind of shocking to hear because it always seemed that Kenseth was loyal to Roush up to the point where it became obvious that the team was in a down downward spiral. Hell, he even ran for Roush in the 6th car in 2018 despite that team really struggling. So it is strange to hear that he almost jump shipped to Childress for, for 2002. Had the move happened, it would have set off a butterfly effect of moves. Does the 17 team go away? After all, Roush just bought Kenseth's Bush Series team owned by Riser and moved the whole operation up to Cup for 2000. Where does Robbie Gordon go? Childress struggled as a whole from 2002 to 2005 with the exception of Harvick's 2003 season, while Roush was the best team in the series in that exact time period. Kenseth and Robbie Riser made the right decision in staying with Roush. Number 3. Jimmy Johnson to DEI Johnson's explosion onto the scene in Cup with Hendrick came out of nowhere considering his average Bush Series performance, but it seems as though other people in the garage, other than Jeff Gordon, saw the talent. On the Dale Jr. download, former DEI general manager and current track house manager Ty Norris recalled begging and pleading with Dale Earnhardt Sr. to hire Jimmy Johnson in the Bush Series for 2001. Earnhardt unfortunately decided to end DEI's Bush Series program after 2000 to focus resources on DEI's new third cup team, so it never happened. I would imagine that Johnson signing with DEI would have taken him out of the frame for Hendrick's 48 car, which, op which opens up a giant can of worms that would have reshaped the sport entirely in the 2000s. I bet Jimmy probably makes his way into the one car after Steve Park's injury, but it's doubtful he ever hits the heights he did at Hendrick. Either way, it would have been an interesting switch, as Johnson wasn't liked by fans from the get-go due to being Jeff Gordon's protege. If he had been Dale Jr.'s running mate from day one, he probably has a much bigger fan base than he does now, at the expense of his on-track success. Between popularity and wins in the championships, I know which one Jimmy prefers, so it all worked out for him at the end of the day. Number 2. Dale Jr.'s 2007 Free Agency When Dale Jr. announced his departure from DEI after 2007, the most intense silly season commenced. It was pretty certain that he was going to sign with another, another Chevy team, so that narrowed his list down to Childress, Gibbs, Ginn Racing, and Hendrick. The Childress connection was obvious, and many thought it likely he would join RCR and bring the three car back. Ginn Racing was a team that seemingly had plenty of backing and a desire to push the team further towards the front, and signing Dale Jr. would open up plenty of new revenue streams that they didn't have previously. It quickly became rumored, however, that Jr.'s choice was really between Gibbs and Hendrick. Gibbs had plenty of benefits over Hendrick as an option. Earnhardt is a lifelong Washington Redskins fan, and Joe Gibbs was actually still in his second stint as their head coach. He was also buddies with Tony Stewart, and especially Danny Hamlin, so the, team, so the teammate relationship would have been seamless. Sponsorship wasn't going to be an issue for Junior no matter where he went. However, Hendrick had the upper hand in terms of the on-track performance, with Gordon and Johnson dominating the field in 2007, and Junior always had a sentimental re uh, relationship with Rick Hendrick. He ultimately decided to drive for Hendrick, but Gibbs had one last chance to sign him. Junior admitted in his interview with Joe Gibbs on his podcast that, he, that had he been offered a 1% ownership stake in the Redskins, he would have signed with JGR on the spot. Obviously, this didn't happen, and Junior went to Hendrick, while JGR made a surprising switch to Toyota for the following season. I'd say it worked out personally for Dale Jr., and JGR became a much stronger team on track thanks to the Toyota switch. Number 1. Dale Earnhardt to Robert Yates Racing This one is number one on the list because it seems so removed from reality. By 1996, Dale Earnhardt had built a brand as the Intimidator and had won six of his seven championships driving for Richard Childress in the three car. He was so linked to Childress, the three, and Chevy that it was almost unfathomable that he would leave. He himself had built a marketing juggernaut selling merchandise and apparel. It made no sense to leave that all on the table. In 1995, Dale Jarrett had substituted for the injured Ernie Irvin in Robert Yates' number 28 and done well. 
The plan for 1996 was to expand to two full-time teams, with Irvin back in the 28 and DJ in the 88. However, Jarrett was planning to start his own team like so many other drivers had done around that time period, leaving the 88 without a driver. It was heavily rumored that Dale Earnhardt was going to leave everything he had built at Childress behind and drive the 88 for Yates. Ultimately, Jarrett, Jarrett couldn't land Hooters as the sponsor for his proposed team, so he stuck with the 8s and the rest is history. This one is crazy due to the fact that Earnhardt could have easily gotten his 8th title if not more. Jarrett narrowly missed out on the 1997 title to Jeff Gordon and eventually won the 1999 title. It's nowhere near crazy to say that Earnhardt could have done just as well in that car. But the idea of Earnhardt ditching the Intimidator persona in Black 3 to drive a Ford that late in his career is wild. It would have paid dividends on the track as Yates was better than Childress at the time. To me, this will always be the craziest rumor that didn't happen because it's so unlikely. Earnhardt and Childress were best buds and stuck together to the end, even when Dale had the opportunity to drive for himself later on. This concludes 10 of the craziest silly season rumors that never materialized. I hope you enjoyed this video and subscribe for more great content. I'll see you all in the next video.